So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm grateful to Manuel Schmidinger, uh, Camilo Porter, and Jean-Jacques Patard for um, asking me to introduce my friend and my colleague, Martin Gore, um, to deliver the Eugene P. Schoenfeld lecture um, to you today. I think in many ways, actually, Martin needs very little introduction to this audience. Um, but for the record, um, as I think many people will realize, Martin uh, co-founded this meeting now in uh, almost 10 years ago in 2004 with Bernard Escudier and a number of other colleagues. And uh, over the years, I think has been a very great friend uh, and supporter of the KCA. Um, Martin's efforts in kidney cancer research um, have been tireless um, over the last 20 years and his efforts along with those of uh, friends and colleagues, many of those uh, in the room, um, have brought about many of the advances that we've been lucky enough to discuss um, during the course of this meeting and have improved um, the treatment of this disease and indeed our understanding of the disease. Um, you can see on the slide now, um, there's a few other things that I'd like to tell you about Martin Gore that perhaps um, his friends in the kidney cancer world don't all know. Where are you, Martin? You don't need to worry. Oh, there you are, good. I'm glad he's here. Um, so, the first thing to say, um, actually, Martin isn't just an internationally recognized figure in kidney cancer, he's actually an internationally recognized figure in ovarian cancer and melanoma, and that's actually not very common, I think, these days, in 2014, to, to be widely recognized in three different tumor types. Another thing is that, um, as Martin likes to say, he has a management job. Um, and uh, typically, modestly, uh, when he says that, what he's actually concealing is the fact that he's the medical director of the Royal Marsden Hospital, so not just the department, the entire hospital. And he's done that for most of the last decade, so that is not by any means a small job. And actually, um, in the last decade, we've probably had the most difficult period in the long history of the institution with the fire in 2008, which I suspect many of you know about, which actually damaged a large part of the hospital in Chelsea. And so without Martin's guidance and leadership at that stage, I think you know, we could have seen very, uh, a different outcome. Um, I'd also like to, to point out, and it, it tells you on this slide, that, that Martin, I think, over the years has mentored dozens um, of doctors in training. Um, some of whom are in the room. Um, you heard from Tim Eisen already this morning. You heard from Charlie Swanson yesterday. Um, I certainly wouldn't be a medical oncologist if it wasn't for Martin. I turned up at the Marsden about 15 years ago as an undifferenti undifferentiated junior doctor, not sure what career to pursue. And it's absolutely as a consequence of Martin that I'm a medical oncologist. And, uh, you know, and I think that should be recognized. And actually, I think mentoring is one of those things we perhaps don't talk about enough or take seriously enough. Martin has dedicated um, his career, actually, to public service, um, to the Marsden, and, and actually also to the National Health Service. And again, I think that's something we, we, we perhaps don't talk about enough. But I think most importantly, um, I'd like to finish by saying that, that Martin is a staunch advocate for patients with cancer. And despite all of his commitments uh, at the Marsden, uh, nationally uh, and internationally, not a, a week has gone by uh, in which Martin hasn't been in the clinic uh, looking after patients and their families and fighting to improve the treatment of this disease. So with that, Martin, um, I'd like to invite you up on stage to give the Eugene P. Schoenfeld lecture and kidney cancer gazing into a crystal ball. Crystal ball. Uh, what will the treatment be like in 2024? Martin. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Dear friends and colleagues, this uh, lecture is dedicated to two surgeons who uh, are sadly no longer with us, Bill Henry, who when I um, arrived on faculty in 1988 uh, and started treating patients with interleukin-2, uh, with kidney cancer and melanoma, he pulled me aside. Uh, because the other urologists would not perform nephrectomies, and they made that very clear the second day I was there. Uh, and Bill pulled me aside. He said, I will do whatever you want me to do. You want me to take the kidneys out, I'll take them out. Uh, I don't know if you're right or wrong, 
with what you're doing, but at least you're trying to do something. You tell me what you want done and I'll do it. And for a young person arriving on faculty, that is really uh, something to hear from a hugely senior and respected uh, surgeon. And then poor Tim Christmas, who was his student, who was probably the most talented surgeon in the UK of his generation, uh, uh, died tragically young. Uh, he was on staff uh, with us, uh, took over from Bill in 2000, and was an enormous supporter of uh, myself uh, and a great help, uh, a wonderful person to work with, a terrible, terrible sense of humor, um, very irreverent, uh, certainly kept me in my place, but, but he sadly missed as well. I want to thank the KCA on behalf of really Bernard and myself because without their support, uh, this meeting would never have happened. We, we wouldn't have dreamed of having it. And you know, the fact that it initially at the time was a, an American uh, patient advocacy, uh, ad advocacy group uh, meant so much to Bernard and myself because they were reaching out to us in Europe. And, and you know, Bill Bro likes to stay in the background, but I, I want to pay tribute to him because uh, his personal drive and support for us has been immense, uh, and I think he's the uh, main reason uh, why we're all here 10 years later. Uh, and of course, uh, dear Ron Bukowski as well, uh, who with Bill um, kind of kept kicking Ben and I to get on with it. So thank you very, very much, Bill and the Casey. I really, really appreciate it. So, this audience probably doesn't know about Eugene uh, Schoenfeld, uh, who was a co-founder of KCA. Uh, he was an academic, as uh, Carrie said yesterday, uh, in uh, journalism mainly. Uh, he, he founded his own uh, company, uh, having uh, completed a PhD at uh, Northwestern. Uh, and tragically, he was, he was uh, diagnosed with kidney cancer at a young age, and in 1989, uh, became the founding president and chief executive officer of KCA. And not many people know that, in fact, KCA grew out of a patient group that Nick Vogelsang, who many of you know, who's been a great uh, friend and inspiration to so many of us, uh, had a patient group uh, which, with great foresight. And Gene went along to the third meeting, and KCA was born, and he drove it, and he drove IL-2, uh, the... the, the um, uh, the licensing of IL-2 at the FDA. He traveled up and down the country, and he was a great advocate, and he tragically died uh, from metastatic uh, kidney cancer at the age of 54 uh, only. And this was the FDA's um, eulogy to him that appeared in his obituary. Uh, and I think it's very interesting that it, it comments on patient activism, uh, something that's very much, and quite rightly, with us now. And this is a man himself. Um, I, I guess we have two things in common. One, he got kidney cancer, and I started kidney, treating kidney cancer at about the same time. Uh, and also, we, we both seem to like rubberware uh, quite a lot. Um, so we're both scuba fans. Um, so this is a look at what's happened and what's going to happen uh, in 10 years' time. But, you know, you don't know where you're going to go to uh, if you don't know where you've come from. And I'm a great believer in learning from the past. So what was it like in 2004? We're now 2014, and the lecture will be about 2024. Well, these were the oral presentations at ASCO in 2004. And you can see um, from, uh, from the titles, and I, I've put in red the... Um, salient points. We, we were starting in the um, targeted era. The education session had education sessions on sinitinib. Um, we were attempting, this is uh, Nick Maisie's work who worked with us, uh, on infliximab, anti-TNF, uh, thalidomide was around, and, and we were starting off in the targeted era 10 years ago, and look where we are um, today, 10 years later, with a lot of information and twice the overall survival for our patients, which is important. The, this is taken from the education book in 2004. And uh, th these are the uh, investigational strategies that are described. And, and, I, and I draw your eye to the immunotherapy uh, section, because I think it's 
relevant. And it's interesting that the list is a bit like David McDermott's list yesterday um, of, uh, relating to combinatorial therapy, and, I, and I'm going to cover that. And then here are the other investigational strategies uh, that you can see uh, listed here. And uh, really, some of the lessons that we learned, we made so many mistakes. If you look at the date of this, this is um, uh, Sylvie Negrien and Van Ars group looked at poor prognosis patients to prove what we kind of already knew or thought we knew from retrospective series that if you had a poor or moderate prognosis, you did not benefit from interferon or interferon on IL-2. But look at the date. It took a long time uh, for that to get to print. And the whole issue about complete remission rates on interferon or did you need interleukin-2 and what, was, what were the real rates of durable CR really um, were only known uh, 10 years ago. And it took a long time when you think that we were using interferon uh, in the 80s to get to some of these quite simple answers to, took a long time. And it took a long time because we did not do the right randomized trials. Uh, we were over-optimistic, and you cannot beat randomization, particularly when you're manipulating the immune system when there are so many biases about which we do not know. And remember, that is the reason for randomizing patients, is to get rid of unknown biases. Could we move the slide forward, please? Thank you. So treatment in 2024. So as far as the targeted agents are concerned, um, we will not be using the TKIs, or at least we will not be using them as we use them now. They are too toxic for chronic treatment, in my view. To have grade w even grade one diarrhea for two or three years is pretty miserable. Uh, to have hand-foot syndrome of grade two for six months is pretty miserable. Uh, this has got to stop. I do, however, believe that VEGF target will remain a target because it's such a powerful biological factor in this disease, but we will develop new molecules, and whether they'll be on chromosome three, as Charlie was talking about yesterday, or whether they will be different targets, I don't know. But always remember that however well we do systemically, and however much people write about, I saw a patient with a cerebral metastasis who responded in their CNS. Remember, CNS disease will always be with us as a sanctuary site, and none of these treatments are that good for CNS disease. So however well we do systemically, always look, uh, always look to the brain. Remember, childhood leukemia was not cured uh, until CNS prophylaxis uh, was successful. So can we move the slide forward, please? So I believe the next 10 years will be dominated by immunotherapy. Uh, we spent the 90s uh, completely dominated by immunotherapy, and we're going to spend the next 10 years uh, dominated by immunotherapy uh, in this condition and probably in melanoma as well. Uh, next slide, please. And immunotherapy is wonderful. Immunotherapy is the world's greatest pharmaceutical company. It is an automated, continuous, personalized molecular identification, patient selection, IMP synthesizing, GMP compliant match manufacturing, treatment delivery system, and it's all in vivo. And it's continuous, and it works 24-7. Uh, and the data from melanoma is extremely exciting because we are waiting for some very important results and the results in melanoma are going to guide other tumor types, I believe. This is data which demonstrates that if you wait long enough and you follow patients up for a minimum of five years, as in this uh, randomized trial with ipilimumab in one arm, you are able to answer the plateau question, and that you cannot answer the plateau question if you do not wait five years. Because what you see is that plateau occurs after three years, but not before. And if you look at some of the data that people are excited about with anti-PD-1, uh, plateau has not been reached and cannot be defined, because as you can see from the sensor points, it is too early. 
And what worries me about anti-PD-1 as a single agent is when I look at this curve, and just to be fair uh, to all companies involved with anti-PD-1, uh, I got a horrible feeling these uh, curves uh, will not platter with PD-1 by itself. Uh, we will know that very uh, soon, I think, uh, very soon meaning in the next uh, year or two, but do not always look at the sensor points and always look at the, the, the uh, x-axis because plateau, we know from Ipilimumab, can only be defined provided you really, really follow everybody up for five years. These, however, are the data on which uh, I make the statement that the next 10 years will be about immunotherapy. The combination of, in this case, nivolumab and ipilimumab has been quite striking. I have been involved in more f false dawns in my career than I uh, care to uh, tell you about. Um, I'm the man who's never performed a successful randomized trial in terms of finding anything useful, but nevertheless, I believe in this, uh, and I think this is extremely important. And what we are learning uh, is that some of the old rules of immunotherapy still apply, and please don't um, forget that. Uh, for instance, LDH, and this has just been published with uh, our colleagues at the NKI, uh, is a prognostic factor in the same way as it was way back in the past when we were doing biochemotherapy with chemotherapy and IL-2 and interferon. So some of these truisms stay true, and immunotherapy is immunotherapy, even though the tools may be different. There are two pivotal trials that we will know the answer to. The first is this trial that we're waiting the answer for, which is a dose question. This will influence our thinking. We think 10 milligrams per kilogram is better, but we don't know. This will tell us, and it will fundamentally change um, the way we think about this, because there is a there is some evidence with interferon and interleukin-2 that things could be, uh, as far as dose is concerned, that there may be a bell-shaped curve. Um, is more better in immunotherapy? Well, not always. And checkmate 067 is extremely important because it will tell us whether the combination makes a difference, uh, and it will also give us randomized data on uh, anti-PD-1 and ipilimumab by itself uh, to look at the plateau. With combinatorial therapy, uh, our experience is that there's quite a lot of toxicity. It's unexpected. It's quite difficult. And everyone is simply throwing corticosteroids at these patients. And I believe we need to go to our hemato-oncology colleagues in transplantation and get some advice about how we manage these patients. And combinatorial immunotherapy will be the way that we will go. And we're going there already, but it frightens me to death because that's where we were in the 90s. We did a series of terrible, uncontrolled phase two and phase 1B studies, and we called them all sorts of things, and we learned nothing. I did a small randomized phase two trial in melanoma, which we included GMCSF in IL-2 interferon. It was totally underpowered, um, hugely toxic. Uh, yes, the old immunotherapies are back, such as adoptive uh, immunotherapy because immune checkpoint inhibition is so important. I'm not saying we should not do this, but if we do not do the trials properly, we will run into all sorts of problems. And, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss Pete Townsend uh, wrote and recorded in 1971 on the Who's Next album. And you need to really reflect on this big time. Because if you look into the face of Ron Bukowski and myself and Bob Figlin and Mike Atkins, you see battle-scarred veterans of people who um, did not learn the lessons quickly enough of immunotherapy and trialing it. Uh, immune monitoring will reemerge. Patient selection, I hope, I hope will become routine. Um, I think PET technology, or, or, or at least uh, diffusion-weighted, uh, imaging uh, will help us 
uh, define who's got an inflammatory response and um, what that means, and remember CNS disease. We saw increasing numbers of CNS metastases with biochemotherapy and melanoma in the 90s because we had a high response rate of about 40% and we were clearing the disease uh, systemically, albeit temporarily, and patients were relapsing in their brain. So the clinical trials must be either biologically based with a biological rationale or, and you don't hear this very often, some sort of systematic rationale. For instance, you might not have the biological basis for knowing when and how to do maintenance. So think of it in a rational, practical way of how you might deliver it uh, in the clinic. For instance, you might want to randomize patients between elective continual maintenance, elective intermittent maintenance, and relapse-directed, quote, maintenance, unquote. In other words, uh, allowing the patient to have an early relapse and jumping uh, on that immediately. That's the sort of pragmatic approach. And we need to do those sorts of trials, even though they're not um, uh, uh, biologically based. We must examine dose and schedule early. I mean, look at the conversation today about the 1-2, uh, the 2-1 uh, sinitinib uh, regimen, for instance. We're 10 years down the line, and we've missed a trick with a uh, treatment schedule that I believe is, would be, is, when I've used it, extremely patient-friendly. Always, always randomized in immunotherapy trials. I did a randomized phase one trial of levamisole, believe it or not, uh, and, and interleukin-2 in the early 90s, and it is doable. I mean, it was completely hopeless, <laughs> but um, it is doable, these sorts of uh, designs, to look for the dose. We have got to stop doing uh, uh, medians and talking about medians. It's completely useless, and it's incomprehensible to the patients besides uh, anything else. We must do time point comparisons. And... Raising the plateau, I believe, in 2024 will be what we are looking for. Will, if the baseline plateau is 20% at five years, i.e. a time point analysis, but it's a plateau analysis as well, what is the effect of treatment X? Does it go up 10%, 30%, 40%? Very, very important data that the patients want to know about, and I suspect the funders of healthcare would as well. I would like to see by 2024 regulators demanding that post-trial treatments and outcomes are collected. The amount of data we have lost by not simply asking investigators, tell us what you gave at second line and what happened. I mean, it's not rocket science. It's dead easy. It's in the patient's chart anyway. And I believe that should be uh, mandated by 2012. Immunotherapy versus targeted agents is not a competition. What the immune checkpoint inhibitors have taught us uh, is that it's all about signaling. It just happens to be about signaling and immunocytes. But the two fields are coming together um, in terms of translational um, research. Uh, I don't believe that combinatorial therapy is going to be successful, I think we will end up sequencing or alternating uh, targeted agents and immunotherapy in 2024. Radiotherapy is going to arrive big time in the management of patients with cancer. Watch in 2024, you will be going to an education session on carbon ion radiotherapy as sure as eggs is eggs. The abscal, the abscal uh, abscapal effect of radiotherapy is going to be very important to us, uh, involved in immunotherapy. First described by somebody who worked at the Howell Atomic uh, Energy Research Institute in the UK in 1953. It's interesting, the word comes from abs, away from, uh, and, uh, which is Latin, and then Greek, uh, skopos, which means a target, and away from the target, and it was described all those, time, all those years ago by R.H. Moll. Stereotactic radiotherapy and maybe carbon ion therapy is going to make the management of relatively slow-growing disease that is oligometastatic 
a complete subject. And you will go to an education session on the management of, of oligometastatic disease, the non-systemic treatment uh, of it uh, in 2024, ASCO-GU. And I think RFA and maybe even partial nephrectomy uh, will be ablated uh, by stereotactic radiotherapy and carbon ions, and you will go and you will listen to the results of a randomized trial between partial nephrectomy and carbon ion therapy, perhaps, and you will need to um, give some money to the poor starving surgeons outside the session uh, whose children are starving and they can't afford, um, well, they won't be able to afford to go to the meeting, poor loves. Um, I'm just going to make two comments about translational research, just to say that I think that pharmacogenomics has been greatly, um, has been ignored too much. Uh, it, 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 it is in some ways the zenith of uh, personalized medicine, uh, and I don't think we pay enough attention to it, and the different um, ethnicities and the, and, and the different uh, pharmacogenomics in those ethnicities, I think does have uh, an, Im an importance, uh, particularly in this uh, globalized world that we uh, now live in. Can the next slide, please? Um, I just really want to make a comment about fishing for biomarkers. The therapeutic target is not a biomarker, so could we stop calling uh, estrogen receptor HER2 and BRAF mutations uh, a biomarker? They are a self-fulfilling prophecy that a treatment is going to work. Biomarker is when you go fishing for a molecule to try and, tell, try and guide you what to do, because you can't work it out for yourself or you're too lazy to do the clinical trial. Terrible history of biomarkers. I mean, there almost has never been one that has been discovered uh, through a fishing expedition. Someone could tell me at lunchtime, I'd be very grateful so I can change the slide. Um, and anyway, with biomarkers, you know, even 80% is not good enough because a patient who is in the 20% will say, well, I want to give me the treatment uh, anyway. I think what's more important is diagnosing response early and methods to do that. I want to just finish off by talking about um, the patients. Um, quality of life has, got, has become a tick box exercise, and this is the quality of life forms for a study that James and I have uh, have just completed. Um, it, it is a farce what is going on with uh, quality of life and in 10 years time it will change. I think we will learn from the qualitative uh, world of research nursing uh, how to handle things because when you look at the data on what doctors think patients want, um, it, it is a terrible indictment of all of us in this room who look after patients. This is an example from breast cancer the red are the, what the doctors think the patient wants in terms of keeping the breast as a top priority or considering prostheses or why you have chemotherapy, and it's completely askew uh, and uh, out of kilter with what the patients actually want. And knowing what the patients want and having people really properly informed and sometimes using um, video assistance uh, and, and, and different types of learning material actually saves money, and it's been calculated that when patients really, r really direct their treatment, that you know, about 20% of patients um, opt for less treatment, about 40% opt, opt for less surgery. Uh, and actually, just by giving patients what they want uh, could save huge amounts of money. And money is kind of what I want to finish on because the, the relationship between the economy and money for research and service and drugs and whether healthcare dollars are moving uh, towards the east away from the EU and maybe the US as well is very important for all of us uh, academics in the room. And we cannot uh, bury our heads in the sand about this. We do need to confront it and we do need to work out what we are going to do about it. And I suspect what uh, uh, and in 2024, we will have had 10 years of um, reducing resource, uh, and we need to have a strategy now for that. So I, I was wondering when I was m talking about this, you know, I, I, the Marsden will carry on brilliantly, um, I'm sure. 
uh, under the leadership of my young colleagues. The question is whether our sister institution, the Gustav Roussy in Paris, what that will look like in 2024. Well, I believe it will thrive. Uh, and obviously the question on everybody's lips is what will Dr. Escudier be doing at the Gustav Roussy in 2024? Well, he will be still, um, he will still be interviewing fellows to work with him. Um, so uh, little will change there, I'm, I'm so pleased to say. So thank you to my team, um, the, the, the residents in, in training, our fellows, um, our data managers, and of course our research nurses. Um, four people, particularly, uh, six people particularly, I want to thank. Um, in 1988, Jackie Moore was um, the sister of our intensive care unit, and she left her job to join me and to open together the biological therapies unit, which we called Grandly. We actually uh, didn't have any patients uh, for a bit, uh, but she, she really drove um, the whole thing. And Linda, who I had known as the most junior houseman at the Marsden, she was um, staff nurse on the ward in 1978, came to join Jackie and I a few years later and has been the complete driving force for um, our research nurses and um, is a great, uh, is an enormous support to, to myself and has been for many, many years. Um, uh, Tim uh, worked with me for a long time and he helped with the, he actually was the first author on the very first paper to describe the, act the activity of thalidomide in cancer. Uh, he helped us with the infliximab program and he drove the targeted uh, therapy program in Riedel, he, he, he um, closed down the immunotherapy program and then left for Cambridge and left me with no immunotherapy program, which is why we are now um, several years behind. Uh, and I just want to thank Tim for ruining my career. Um, but, but, you know, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, we, we, are, we have repaired it. Uh, two relatively new faces for us, uh, Lisa Pickering, another medical oncologist, um, and David Nicol, who we uh, appointed uh, a little while ago as our chief of surgery, who's a urologist who you heard from yesterday, who's been a fantastic support. And I thought we would never replace Tim, um, but we have uh, in spades. Uh, David is wonderful. And of course, uh, my dear colleague and friend, uh, James, who now uh, runs the show and who I uh, work for. Although as medical director, I am still in control of his salary. Um, <laughs> Finally, of course, the patients and their families. Thank you very much.